Hi, everyone. I know people are still joining us, um, but in the spirit of starting on time, I want to get started. I just want to make sure I am recording. Okay, we are. So just so that you all know, we are recording tonight's session um, so that <clears throat> families who can't join us will have access to information, uh, but always like to share that in advance. So welcome. Uh, it feels like it has been a long time since we last spoke. Um, I must say that these are always the highlights of my month. I love being able to come together with our families and talk about the summer. And I, I always feel um, so grateful and um, really, really proud of, of how understanding all of you continue to be. Uh, uh, navigating this uncharted territory, the fact that we don't have every answer the fact that sometimes we say great question, we probably won't be able to get back to you for a bit with that. Um, so I wanna start tonight off uh, on behalf of Neil and Amy and myself and the entire JCC team uh, to it's thank Sam you again for- things. And Sam's in the classroom and pretended to be- Hold on <laughs> one second. Let's, if you are not on mute, if you could please mute yourself. Thank you. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, so tonight, um, the goal is to walk you through more information of what we know, uh, to share with you um, our plan for caring for our campers and for our staff, and to talk to you about how we're going to uh, disseminate information that we don't quite have yet, <clears throat> uh, and then to leave it open for question and answer. So as we have in the past, uh, please feel free to use the chat um, as a place to put your questions. Um, and Neil and Amy and I are uh, a fabulous trio that bounces things off of each other. Um, and so one of the three of us will always be someone that can answer your question. You Again, if you're not on mute, I'm just gonna ask you to please mute um, and that will allow us to walk through tonight. So let's get started. So we're going to start with uh, COVID updates. So the uh, CDC released some new guidance over the weekend, which I, I th thought was really funny. Like who releases guidance on a Saturday uh, when people aren't working and they're not able to get to it right away, but that's okay. So they released it on Saturday and uh, the guidance is meant to, meant to supplement, not to replace the guidance that we're going to receive from New York State. So the information that we got I think actually made us feel really good because it, it is completely in line with the plans, with our thinking, with the way that we're going to organize this summer. Um, there were a few key points that, you know, really continue to drive home for us that we wanted to talk about. Uh, but for the most part, nothing in this uh, guidance that was released changed our plans. The big information is from New York State, and unfortunately, we still have not received that. Uh, we continue to stay in really close contact with our partners at the Department of Health in Gates County, and uh, they're kind of like a little broken record, and they keep saying it's coming soon, it's coming soon. However, or and, I think now that the CDC has released their guidance, um, that will hopefully give New York State some confidence to release their their guidance as well. But what we've heard from people who have perhaps inside connections or are sitting in Albany around the table and know someone who's in that, who's sitting around the table is that there shouldn't be much information that is a surprise to us. Um, so the key points, again, things that we know, things that you guys are living in your regular lives, um, consistent and layered use of multiple prevention strategies is really important. So all the things that we've been talking about, how we're going to mask, how we're going to wash our hands, how we're going to keep clean, how we're going to stay in cohorts, all of those things continue to be vitally important for the success of the summer. Uh, the CDC is monitoring the new COVID-19 variants and how we can help with prevention in camps. So this is something that's obviously new and upcoming information that um, we don't have we don't have all the answers to, although we don't have the, all the answers to everything quite yet. So please know that as we learn more information, we will keep you up to date on that. Um, and again, the, the, you know, the best practice is that cohorts are defined as groups of campers and staff that stay together. Um, and this is information, again, that we've been talking to you about for a long time. So we feel really good uh, that we are following in the guidance of what the CDC recommends. 
A lot of you have had questions and we completely understand on uh, drop off and pick up and testing. So drop off and pick up times are not yet determined. Um, and that is because we need to confirm what our testing protocol is. So what we know for yes, sure- Yes, he does, I've told him to. Oh. Um, so what we know for sure is that we are going to be requiring negative PCR mm -hmm. testing 72 hours prior to your arrival. Um, as you know, up until, yeah. well, as of right yeah. now, the information, if you guys could just mute yourself, if you're not on mute, that would be really helpful. Thank you. Um, the information that we had released to our families said that we were going to be doing rapid testing upon arrival. The CDC recommendations that came out over the weekend um, state that the new guidelines suggest that screening um, should be three to five days after arrival in accordance with the CDC travel guidance. So we're waiting to get more information from the Department of Health. Um, honestly, that, that recommendation means drop off goes much smoother and can go faster. And, uh, and so this is, a, this is potentially a great plan for us, but we really wanna hear from New York State before we release that information. Uh, families who are bringing more than one camper to drop off, you will be able to drop you off your campers at the same time. We promise not to make this a terrible experience for you. We know that it is um, an inconvenience to working parents and we truly thank you um, for your ability to be flexible and to help us with this. So again, we, we're gonna commit, you know, next month, if we don't have information, we're gonna put a stake in the ground in committing to what we think is the best practice. And then of course, we'll need to just be flexible um, if we need to make changes. So I'm just gonna check in on some questions. What does staying in cohorts look like in the dining hall and what is the percentage of capacity in camp in general? Great question. So all of our, um, all of our cabins are at 50% capacity, which means that the cabins have between six to eight campers. And we have a formula that tells us what our capacity is in each cabin. And so we know if it's six to eight campers um, and about two to three staff members. So there will be plenty of room um, on, on all of the sides and for the kids to be separated. We did this math way back in, gosh, we started it last summer. Uh, measuring out and making sure that the kids would be safely distanced from each other um, in their cabins. And one of the things that I've read um, is that, you know, if you want to send your kid with, with containers to keep their clothes in, like there's, there's interesting ways that you can keep your camper stuff in, you know, tidy, tight, nicely uh, put into a container rather than being out in, you know, in a cubby next to someone else's. And so we'll, as we get closer to getting that guidance, we'll release some more information if we've got suggestions. Um, so uh, the question is about if your kids are vaccinated, do you still need tests every week? So the guidance that came out over the weekend, the answer was no, you don't. However, New York state trumps anything that the CDC says. The CDC is just recommendations, New York State is our guidelines. So we need to wait to hear from New York State. Um, we are gonna follow what they suggest um, and, and we're gonna go from there. Today, they stated that if vaccinated masks are not required, today they stated that if vaccinated masks are not required outside, could it be possible for vaccinated teens? So it's a great question. We are definitely gonna continue to follow what the recommendations are on vaccinated teens together and staff that are together. One of the things that we want to be really careful and mindful of is making sure what it looks like for individuals who might not be vaccinated. Um, but we certainly recognize and please know from the bottom of my heart, if we could have our masks off and we can be safe, I want us to be safe and I want us to be able to feel that fresh air on our cheeks. Um, so we're going to continue to follow what the recommendations are. And I think that that, that, that information is really going to come from New York State as we get closer. You know, I didn't even see that that came out. Information is changing on a daily basis. And we just really appreciate all of you being flexible and working with your campers on understanding that we're going to get this information at the very last minute. Um, I'm going to pause for a second and then we'll get back to, oh no, let's do this. Can you request a drop off window to accommodate travel plans? That's a great question. Neil, actually, um, Neil, do you want to talk a little bit about what you were thinking about in terms of how we're going to work with families who are traveling and your new like technology plans for this as of today? 
Yeah, so in conjunction with a couple of other camps that we've been talking to, uh, there's a program called Calendly where you can, uh, we've been using it for like signing up for Zoom conversations with uh, the camp team, but other camps are using it to schedule their drop-off procedures. And I imagine that uh, through, we're gonna have to do some uh, like backend testing uh, to see if it works for our community, but uh, there will be like a link that goes out at some point and families will be able to uh, check a time that works for them for drop off and pick up uh, more information on that to come. Uh, I think that'll be better for the community than us dictating uh, a time frame. Pa uh, families will be able to pick a little bit more. Thanks, Neil. That's great. Um, just going to answer a couple more questions and then we're going to keep moving through the presentation and continue to ask questions um, as we go along. So how will luggage get to camp? So uh, as we had mentioned back in October when we released our information, we are not offering transportation to camp this year. And so you are required to get your kids uh, luggage to camp. Um, if you are traveling in and you want to ship luggage, you are more than welcome to do that. Um, and Amy and Neil and I can help you with that coordination. Um, and, you know, I, there's a group of Maryland families that I know have been talking to each other and thinking about how they can all get their, their luggage together. So we, again, you know, we recognize that some of these things are inconvenient and not what we traditionally do. Um, and we appreciate you understanding these unusual circumstances. Uh, so yes, the counselors will be a part of the cohorts and um, they, they are allowed to go out at night. And I, first and foremost, there is nowhere to really go at night. So let me be clear that the town is shut, the town is shut down. Um, if they need to run into town to pick something up, they are required to be following all of the guidelines of wearing masks and staying outside. And you know, we have been working really closely with our staff that we've hired. And one of the things that we say to them is, you know, no one wants to be the reason why camp closes down. Um, we, we've been talking a lot with other camps and a lot of camps, everyone is on a different spectrum of what, they're, how they're choosing to work with their staff for the summer. And we feel really strongly that our staff's mental health and their well-being and their ability to safely go out and pick up a coffee at the drive through through Dunkin' Donuts, um, if that's something that's important, if they are able to follow the rules and sign a code of conduct the same way that our campers are signing code of conducts and you're signing code of conducts for when your campers come home during intercession, that we will be able to run safely. I also feel confident because last summer when we ran our family camp weekends, our staff did go, they were able to leave camp. Um, so we never closed our bubble fully. And as you know, as I've mentioned, um, we had over 700 people come through camp last summer and we had no known cases of COVID and that was before there were any vaccines that were available. We are not requiring our staff to get vaccines because um, it is not best practice right now to require vaccinations of something that is not approved, that is being approved for emergency use. Um, and so this is kind of across the country. Most camps and organizations do not require it. We highly recommend it. Um, and we will help our staff to understand the importance of it. Um, in full transparency, uh, the, our staff were knocking down the doors up two months before we could get them uh, vaccinated, asking every which way for us to help them. We feel really good and Neil, feel free to chime in that our staff want to be vaccinated and, and are for the most part from what I know so far. Great, he's nodding yes. Okay, let's, uh, let's keep moving on. So this talk, this goes right in line with um, what we were talking about for our campers and for our staff. So a question came in before, um, the session started if we had had any consideration to keeping the kids who plan to attend consecutive sessions at camp. And we know that this has been a continuous discussion that we've had, and we've really appreciated your understanding that we need to send our campers home um, unless they are coming in from out of town. And again, that's for multiple reasons, including the cleaning and the disinfection, and also truly needing to give our staff time off. Um, this summer, as you know, is going to look different than any other summer in the past. And as committed as we are to keeping our campers safe and healthy, we're also committing that to our staff as well. 
and we want to make sure that they have time to recharge their um, their energy as well. So there is an index um, at a, that a camp family actually sent this to me from another camp that I loved, and it talks about the low, low, medium, medium, uh, medium, high, and high risk activities. I'm going to get this out to all of you. The recommendation is that you stay in the low and the low, medium risk activities between sessions, and these are really the best practices of ways that we can take care of ourselves um, on a regular basis. Of course, everyone can choose to do what works best for them in their uh, risk tolerance. And, and we ask everyone, our staff and our families and our campers and your leadership team uh, to also you know, stick with our low risk tolerance activities uh, before camp and during camp sessions. So let's go into camper care. And of course, there'll be more time to ask questions about uh, COVID later. So we wanted to take a good chunk of uh, tonight's session to talk to you about our recognition of our campers' individual needs this summer. Um, it is a goal always of Camp Seneca Lake to provide a safe and healthy and inclusive social environment for our entire community. Camp is a place that we want our campers to feel safe and nurtured and accepted. And after all of this time from being gone um, and from what we've been through, we really wanna make sure that our campers have a sense of control over their actions and their environment and that they feel empowered to have an incredible experience this summer. I've been talking a lot with, with the team um, that for me, a theme for this summer is about human reconnection. And that after a year and a half of isolation, uh, for our campers and for our staff, for all of us really, that we are coming together as a community with a sense of purpose. And, and that purpose is to reconnect. And first it's to reconnect with ourselves and then it's to reconnect with each other. And we truly believe that there's no better place to do this than at Camp Seneca Lake. So how are we going to support our staff and our campers to be able to accomplish this? Uh, we are training our staff this summer on recognizing the signs of emotional distress and trauma and coping with stress. Um, we're going to be discussing and sharing stress reduction strategies, uh, talking about mindfulness practice, social support, deep breathing, spending time outside in nature, and how all of these things can help us through the healing process. We recognize that not everyone's going to come to camp with these concerns, but we want to be fully prepared to support our staff for anything that campers might exhibit. Um, every time a camper comes down to Camp Road for the, for the first time that, that year, they're on a blank slate. And while we think about all of the things that we know in the past, we really want to make sure that they have their chance to live their best self on who they are at that moment in time. And so we're really going to focus on that this summer. So what does this look like? We wanna create a positive environment. And that I just realized, I apologize. We wrote, I wrote role modeling twice, but that must mean that I just really love the concept of role modeling. Uh, so we're gonna focus and talk about role modeling and positive reinforcement, uh, setting up a predictable environment, working on problem solving, on proactive expectations, the importance of structure and routine and building relationships. So what does that look like? What is our plan? How are we going to do this? So I've mentioned to you all in the past, we're really excited that we have a beautiful collaboration with um, Jewish Family Service in Rochester. And Megan Black is a school guidance counselor who has been really active in the Rochester Jewish community. And she is going to be um, a, a staple at camp this summer. She's going to be at staff training. She's going to be at camp for the first couple of days of each session, helping to transition our campers from home to camp life um, and supporting our, our staff in understanding how to best work with campers. Our unit heads are gonna participate in regularly scheduled supervision where they're gonna be able to bring concerns that they have to a, um, a mental health professional who will help them understand how to really work with campers and how to avoid having something escalate without having real intention and meaning in the way that we interact with, with our campers. We are going to have increased in-service trainings. Um, I'm really excited to share that we're at the beginning stages of creating a new quiet space at camp. Um, this is a space that uh, is for campers and for counselors. It's a place to go when you feel like there's too much going on and maybe you just need to play with a fidget toy 
or you need to talk with a counselor, or maybe you just need to read a book and you need a different environment. Um, it is gonna be a multi-purpose use space that we will of course keep uh, COVID clean uh, and follow all of the regulations in order to be able to make sure that uh, it can be used and that we clean in between, in between uses. And then we've created a new process called the chesed process, which uh, in Hebrew means loving care. And one of the things that I've been really excited about working with the team on this year is thinking about how we work with our campers when there is a concern that a counselor brings to the table about how a camper might be acting, um, a struggle that they might be having, or a family member fills out a form prior to camp and alerts us of a, um, a need that a camper has or a concern and something that a parent might want us to be aware of. And in the past, there has been times where perhaps you've received a phone call and we've kind of gotten all the way to we're concerned and your camper might need to leave camp. And the goal for our chesed process is for you to be really clear on all the steps that we're gonna take partnering with you and with our camp community to take care of your camper and to allow them the opportunity to learn and grow with us. So let's talk about what that looks like. So uh, the first thing that's gonna happen is either our counselors are gonna observe a need or you're gonna alert us of a need. Um, so this might be that a counselor observes a behavior and activity. They hear, they hear a quote that like, they're like, huh, that doesn't really sit well with me. I think I better document this I better write down this, this observation and I'm gonna go bring this to my unit head. So if now, in a, and if you alert us in advance, which we're gonna talk about in a few minutes, we're gonna kind of skip a couple of steps, but let's talk about as if your camper is at camp and they've had an interaction, something's happened and we feel like we need to address it and the counselor needs support. So they're, gonna, they're going to observe this, they're gonna write it down and then they're gonna have a unit review. And this is where our counselor and our unit head are going to meet and they're going to review concerns and our unit head may observe the camper or the situation in a non-obtrusive way, just in the way that uh, in a school, you might have another teacher come in and observe and see what's going on. And then the unit head will determine if we need to move forward, right? If we want to bring a meeting together um, and collaborate on next steps. So step three is the chesed team meeting. So this would be the counselor, the unit head, and our, um, our healthcare team. So Megan, uh, myself, a nurse, another specialist at camp, we're gonna meet and discuss the concerns. And the goal is that by the end of that meeting, we're gonna agree upon the areas of need for our camper, the measurable goals and accommodations, and the modifications and supports that they will need to reach their goals. Then we're gonna implement and we're gonna monitor. So our whole team will get trained on what's needed. So if we recognize that a camper is really struggling with transitions, we're gonna make sure that the counselor and the team that's working with that camper understands how to support them through transitions. We're not gonna assume that anyone knows. We're gonna do that some on the ground learning and be able to support everyone around our campers. Um, our counselors will implement these accommodations and these modifications. They're gonna to continue to collect data and um, they're gonna, then they're gonna meet again and we're gonna review it. So in our progress reporting, this whole team reconvenes, they're gonna review the data and the progress and they're gonna determine the next steps. And in the next steps, one of a couple of things could happen. Either our camper has mastered their goals and this protocol is no longer needed. We decided that we wanna to continue to monitor the camper um, they're progressing towards meeting their goals, but maybe we want to keep, we want to tweak the accommodations or the modifications or the supports until our goals are mastered. And the last part is that our camper hasn't made measurable progress towards meeting the goals. And so then we're going to call you on the phone and we're going to talk to you all about steps one through six, and we're going to ask for your input and your suggestions. And then we're going to repeat steps four, five, and six. So now you're a part of our team. You're helping us to problem solve and to think about what we can do. And we're gonna try that. And then if we get through that again and we get to sit step, step six again, then we're gonna have a conversation about if there are concerns about whether um, camp is the right place for your camper. So this was really important for me to share with you both in you understanding 
our, our commitment and our, and our goal and how we're going to care for campers this summer, but also so that you understand when you get a phone call, what it is that we're doing um, and, and how we're going to be supporting our campers and that you don't feel as alerted because you know that there is a team and a process behind all of this work. So more to come on this um, as we get it kind of finalized into a document, but I felt like it was the right time to share with you this, this really wonderful progress um, that we've made. So with that, we have some asks for you. Uh, please complete your paperwork on Camp Minder as soon as possible. Uh, Amy tells me you are doing a really wonderful job on getting your paperwork done, so please continue to, um, to work on that. If your camper is currently seeing a therapist, we are happy to work with you to arrange for them to continue to receive those support services. So that quiet space that I said we were creating, uh, renovations to our office that we've recently done, we can find ways to work with you where it's kept confidential and your camper isn't missing big important events. Um, you know, even two weeks away from therapy can be hard on a kid. And it's interesting that we, we were talking recently about how sometimes people stay on medication and you don't stop medication. So why would you stop therapy? So if you, your child is receiving any sort of support services and you wanna continue those, please talk to us. Um, we will keep all information confidential and we just wanna support your camper or campers staying healthy and happy. Please discuss changes in medication with your physician ahead of time. Um, we know that uh, medication breaks over the summer are something that parents do, uh, that families do. And we want you to know that with everything that we've just shared, we're really not designated to support the unknowns of medication breaks. Um, and we would love for you to talk with your physician before you make that decision on with all of the transitions and the changes that we've had this year, whether this summer is the right time for a medication break. Uh, the last thing that we ask of you is to schedule a meeting to discuss your camper's care plan. So if you think, if you know that your camper is someone who would benefit from that process that we talked about and, and not having to go through the process at camp because you've already identified what you can do to help them, let's get a meeting on the calendar. Um, you will be receiving an email from me tomorrow with um, a way to schedule appointments with me, a 30 minute meeting. And that is for us to work on a care plan. And um, I, I wanna make sure that you recognize that this isn't for you know, a child who has a diag, just for children who have a diagnosis or a medical concern. This is for, even if you're concerned about what it means to be away from your parents, the more information that we have on your children and the more we can understand how to support them, the more successful we are gonna be this summer. Um, and the last piece that I'll add is that we're gonna send you a couple of days before camp starts, a couple of questions about your kids. And even though you've already answered questions, the information that you answered a month ago or last week or today, your kids are probably gonna still be different when they, a few days before they arrive at camp. And so we're gonna ask you questions on how your child is glowing, how your child is growing, and what, what, you can, what we can do to help deescalate them when perhaps they're feeling, um, when they're feeling frustrated and what we can do to connect with them. And, and the specific reason why we're gonna wait to ask those questions until right before camp is because we want the most accurate information to be able to work with our counselors on understanding who's coming down camp road and how we can honor and celebrate who they are as individuals. So come visit camp. We've got some information to give you um, and then we're gonna open it up for a question. So we just created today, uh, we have one mitzvah day scheduled, but we have decided to add in uh, a month worth of mitzvah days. So we're calling it May mitzvah days and we're welcoming anyone to come to camp uh, masked and following all uh, COVID protocols to be able to help with projects around camp. Um, there is information on Facebook. This will come also in an email uh, tomorrow for you to be able to sign up, but a wonderful opportunity to be able to come and help clean up camp and get it ready for the season. We also have, right, there we go. Okay, so um, you will also get tomorrow links for two Zooms for next month. 
Uh, I've heard some wonderful feedback from parents that a new parent get together on Zoom would be super helpful uh, for parents who have never sent kids to camp before that you have different questions than parents who have been sending their kids to camp for 12 years. So we're going to have a Zoom dedicated just for you and asking all your questions and meeting other parents who are first time camp parents. And then we will have a May update a month from today. As I have always committed to you, if I get information before then, I will not make you wait. We will get you that information. We can always change the date of the Zoom, uh, but this allows us about a month to pull together and do that final planning on all of the details that we know you are so patiently waiting on. Uh, Sunday, June 6th is open house. Uh, this is a day at camp that is really tailored towards um, uh, families of new campers to be able to come to camp, meet Neil and Amy and myself and some of our other leadership team, walk around, get accustomed to camp. Um, it is an, a day that is open. Um, we're not closing the gates to anyone, but we really ask that you that you come if you if you need to get that open house experience. So I'm going to close my screen because then I can see all of your faces and open this up for uh, questions and answers or questions that we say we don't have the answers for yet, but we'll get there. So feel free to unmute yourself, type anything into the chat box, um, anything you're you're thinking about. Lori? Yes. Hi, it's Jeremy Schwimmer. Um, Hi. I have a question. Hi. It is a balmy 85 degrees down here in case you guys are still fighting snow, but um, that's anyway, such a kind uh, way for you to, to right. say hello to you like that? Yeah, well, that, that, so that nice. I thought you'd be, <laughs> I've been rubbing this to all my friends in upstate New York. Anyway, um, a couple of questions we had, uh, I, I'll email you one because it's kind of unique to us okay. with school, school starting and things, but okay. um, intercession, you kind of touched on intercessions. It, 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 what's, what's the sort of the general thought on intercession? Because we'll have two, Leo will have two and leaving and we're going to be up there and so on. But is there anything special or, or or we need to think about about the, that day and a half that in the past probably wouldn't have been such a big deal, but now because of the circumstances are going to be you know a little bit more scrutiny coming back into camp. Is it going to be sure. more like you know? Can you talk a little bit about how yeah. intercession? Yeah, Neil. Work? Neil, do you want to take this question? Yeah, uh, happily. Um, if I if I don't quite answer your question, just just shout at me and I I'll do my best. But essentially, following. Uh, the the matrix that Lori put on the screen a, a couple of minutes ago, the low risk activities and the low to medium risk activities. If your family sure. is able to follow those, then yep. there shouldn't be any issues coming back from camp because in theory you're sort of in an extension of a quote unquote bubble of CSL during that time sure. frame. Um, sure. So we ask like, don't you know, do your best to like you know pick your kids up and and don't go to an amusement park or like don't go to yeah, the movie. You know, stay, stay low key, stay, stay in your small group. Um, and then, you know, assuming those things stay in place, then coming back to camp shouldn't be uh, a problem at all. I don't think that we are going to ask a family that has been at camp for a session that leaves to come back with another negative PCR test. I don't think there's time for that, Correct. which is part of the protocol that we are developing okay. now uh, for testing. So just on the initial uh, arrival to camp. And then is, is the, from a practical perspective, is it the same sort of calendarly, I used the wrong, the wrong yeah. tech company, but is it the same process to schedule time to come back? So that we'll do that at drop off, we'll do it at each intercession. And I assume it every time, as well. every time you're coming down the road on opening or closing day, uh, your time will be planned by you through Calendly ahead of time. So Calendly, know, you say that know, it's very carefully. hard to say. Calendly, <laughs> I'm not sure, uh, but yeah. you'll, you'll know with, you know, a couple of days at least notice what time we're anticipating. And of course, um, it'll be flexible, but it's just, it's just a way for us to sort of navigate. Yeah. Uh, the, the road is really not a two way road. So we need to like be strategic about how many cars are coming down and how many cars are going up and, and at what time. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you, Neil. Um, so there's a question about out of town families flying in and is there a quarantine requirement? So we're following what the New York state guidelines are. Um, and so as of right now, um, you know, the guidelines say that you can fly in and there's, there's this, the information that's available on uh, the New York State Gov website. We will follow those rules. 
Um, and so if for some reason those those change and they become more strict, we of course will work with you to figure out what we can do to make sure that uh, after following those guidelines that we can get you to camp. Uh, so staff recruiting is going well. Um, you know, in full transparency across the country, overnight camps have more kiddos who want to come to camp than staff who are available. Uh, and that is a nationwide problem, not just in camps, but for those of you who perhaps run businesses, something that you're experiencing as well. I will say that we are really lucky that we have a really supportive community that is um, interested in being able to support us in any way possible. So one of the things that we did was the same way that we looked at our schedule for this summer and we changed the two, three and a half week sessions to uh, three two week sessions and one one week session. Um, we are talking to our staff with the same, right? So we, we made this accommodation for campers to be able to get more campers to camp. And we really realized that we should be making the same accommodation that we shouldn't say to staff, you either can work the whole summer or you can't work at all. So we are really excited about this new opportunity that we've brought to our community's table and are uh, working to fill our positions. Um, in creative ways. And we have no doubt that camp is gonna be full and incredible. Um, as you know, will it look exactly the same as it has in the past? No, but um, different is beautiful. And I know that we're gonna have a fabulous summer. Uh, there was a question about, um, about cooking uh, and a rumor that staff might be cooking food. Um, and I love I love CSL rumors. They're, they're my one of my favorites. So we have a head chef. Uh, coming to camp and uh, we have a professional staff coming and we have cooks coming to camp. We have told our staff that there is a chance that we will all need to take some shifts, helping to get the dishes cleaned and helping to make sure that our, our kitchen runs smoothly because we may not have the full 11 staff in our kitchen. We may have eight staff in our kitchen and two floats who rotate through to help support the kitchen. I will say that this is the standard in every camp, probably except for ours. And we're really excited um, that across our camp this summer, we are hiring our staff, not just for one area, but we're hiring them to be a part of our camp. And so that might mean that you work in the kitchen, but you're also a psychology major and are a part of um, a group of people who are coming together to work on a psychology project. You may be a nurse that also loves swimming and run a hobby group in the pool. Um, we really wanna tap into our staff's talents and also help them get out of their comfort zone. So we have, uh, rest assured, Wolf Foods is, our, is providing our food this summer. We have a head chef and we have our baker and our manager and our kitchen staff. Um, we are looking for more staff and that's not anything that we feel ashamed to share because the more people we tell, the more wonderful staff that can join our community for the summer. Lori, I just want to jump in on that and yeah. say that uh, historically at, at Camp Seneca Lake, the expectation has been that, that, that staff are Camp Seneca Lake staff members first and foremost, and then their second role is sort of whatever they've been hired as counselor, uh, waterfront specialist, athletics, whatever it may be. Uh, so that rumor sort of spurred out of a conversation that we were having with the staff for this upcoming summer, which was really just being explicit about uh, the expectation for the summer that we're all going to be involved in areas that are outside of perhaps what we know of our role to be or what we think our role may be. For example, uh, Amy and I are lifeguards and finished that certification a couple of weeks ago. And, uh, you know, on the first day when all the campers are uh, doing their swim checks, like Amy and I are going to be in the chairs uh, being a part of that. And I'm, we're both fully prepared to be like peeling potatoes and washing dishes, as Lori mentioned, and uh, driving boats and like doing everything that needs to get done because ultimately the staff are the staff and the work is, is the work and it needs to get done. It doesn't matter what your, your job title is. So um, that's, I think that rumor just came out of an extension of the conversation we were having with the staff, which was uh, an explicit conversation about the expectations relative to the workload and the things that need to get, need to get done at camp. Thanks, Neil. Beautifully said. Um, Sherry, you asked a question about guidelines or rules for taking pictures with phones. Are you referring to campers taking pictures with phones or staff taking pictures with phones and or both? And you can either take yourself off mute or send it in the chat so I know. Campers. Okay. 
Neil, do you want to talk about camp, about phone, our phone policy and taking photos? Surely. Um, I don't think we've changed our, our phone policy over the past few years. Essentially, uh, back like maybe 10, 15 years ago, uh, cell phones were like absolutely no go at Camp Seneca Lake because uh, there were no cameras in phones and like CD players were not in phones. And now we recognize that like all of those things are one device and uh, people may not have a camera that is not attached to their cell phone. So uh, the, the rule is that campers can bring their phone or their iPod. Um, I, I wouldn't say that iPads are going to be okay, but I, uh, their phones or whatever um, for, for the purpose of, of taking pictures. But uh, we really are going to ask that the campers keep their, the, the, whatever phones they have in their bunks slash in their villages um, usually we see like people want to take pictures on Shabbat when everyone looks nice. Uh, but we have a full-time photographer who's working at camp this summer who will be taking, uh, beautiful pictures, a job that I used to have at Camp Seneca Lake. And ultimately, uh, we feel like the, the importance or one of the important things of camp is disconnecting from technology and spending time outdoors. So we're not going to encourage people to have, uh, their cameras on them all the time, especially like during a water balloon fight or something like that. And Camp Seneca Lake will not be taking responsibility for anyone's uh, cell phone if they do have it and get a water, ball, a water balloon thrown at them. Like, uh, you know, that sort of comes with the territory of having that device. I will also mention that uh, we have, um, Camp now has a PA system and a uh, all the support staff, senior staff people will have walkie talkies. So even the, the support staff, uh, unit heads, et cetera, will not be carrying their uh, cell phones on them throughout the day. So we're really trying to disconnect from uh, from the screens. As you all know, everyone's been so connected to their screens for the past year, year and a half. Uh, this summer is really important for us to, to disconnect in some way. So that's a roundabout way of saying like, yeah, it's fine, but also we're not going to encourage it outside of the village or at all for that matter. Thank you, Neil. Um, just to follow up, so the COVID testing requirements for kids prior coming camp is a, a negative PCR test 72 hours prior to arrival. What we haven't told you yet is what you're supposed to do with those results. And we are working on that and we will get that information to you, stay tuned. Um, how will hobbies work this summer? Will different villages be able to be in hobbies together? Neil. Uh, uh, so so we're going to, going to operate the first few days uh, of camp following the cohort model uh, and um, keeping groups of campers separate from each other until uh, we have some answers from the from the testing thing. Um, um, sorry, I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna mute. From the testing uh, uh, procedure, whatever it may be. Uh, so we, we do anticipate by the end of the session that we're able to do a little bit more mixing of the campers and, and do things such as like, hobbies where older campers and younger campers could be doing this, the same activities at the same time. But essentially like uh, whatever the programs are, it's not going to look that much different. It's just gonna be uh, a little bit more spaced out and people will be wearing masks if they're mixed. Uh, and yeah, I apologize for not having like a better answer on what hobbies will specifically look like, but uh, we're sort of waiting until New York State guidance comes out for the testing protocol before we can make that specific decision. Thank you. Uh, swim tests, what will they be like? I'll answer that one too. Uh, so every, every day or every first opening day of, uh, of each session, all of the campers are going to be getting in the water just to demonstrate their abilities in the, with, with swimming. And that will sort of determine uh, what sort of attention we need to pay to them in terms of giving uh, swim instruction um, and what parts of the pool campers will be allowed in. Someone who's designated as a non-swimmer uh, will still be able to get in the pool, just not in like the deep end part of it and, and uh, things along those lines, or maybe with like floaties on or something like that. So we really, we just get all the kids in the pool uh, on the first day just to see where their um, abilities and, and skills are. And we do the same thing with the staff uh, as well. So it's not like your camper needs to go and, and practice swimming and prepare and, and perfect their strokes. Um, we just want to see if, if, if the pool is an activity that they can do uh, right off the bat or if they need a little bit of uh, support from us to, to, to get in the water. 
Awesome. Thank you. So there was a question about Shabbat and what it will look like. Um, and I will say we know that it's going to look special. Um, we are working to make sure that um, we can eat dinner as a community. So one of the things that we're exploring is having Shabbat dinner on the tennis courts so that we are outside and socially distant, but that we can be together. Um, and as we get more guidance, we will be um, imagining what it can look like. We're working on a lot of different scenarios on um, how we can bring our campers together for Shabbat and our staff um, for both Friday night and Saturday. And so there will be a Shabbat experience. Will it look like 100% what it did in 2019 or those of you who grew up at camp, what it looked like then? It might not, it might look a little different, um, but rest assured we're working really hard and we have a team already working on what it could look like based on our different scenarios. Um, and we know that it, it will still be special and a wonderful experience. So there's a question about um, if you're vaccinated or are you allowed to leave camp and come back um, without uh, being quarantined or uh, being tested. So that's actually something that we have not talked about yet. Um, and so if you uh, wouldn't mind letting us work, talk about that as a team, um, we will be happy to get back to you um, if that's something that you need more information on. Uh, so you are um, not able to help them unpack. Um, you are dropping them off with their luggage and giving them a hug and turning around and going away. And we know that's going to be really hard. And we're going to do everything we can to support you. Um, our counselors are going to be fully prepared to help them unpack and get settled. Uh, part of our building our cohort and also helping our campers with building their independence is helping them to learn how to unpack and get settled. Um, so in the car line will be where you give your hugs and to say goodbye. Because as you can imagine, if we had people coming into the cabins, uh, we would have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of people. Um, and that sounds really fun, but we wanna do our best to um, keep a safe small community for COVID. So. More information when we finalize what drop-off will look like. Uh, we are going to do our best to keep our campers happy. We know it's going to be hard for both of you to say goodbye, but we promise we'll make sure their beds are made. Uh, yes. Sorry, sorry, so, I just want to jump in. There was yeah. a, a comment from uh, Nina, which I thought was great because I, I forgot a huge piece of having the, the technology at camp, and that is uh, that anyone who brings a cell phone uh, or a device that has the ability to connect to Wi-Fi or to uh, LTE, whatever it might be, uh, the SIM cards need to be taken out before they uh, come to camp. And if we find SIM cards uh, at camp, it'll it'll be a little bit more of an intense conversation with uh, the family and with the campers. But yeah, take your kid's SIM card out of their phone if you're sending them with it so that they can take pictures, please and thank you. Neil, do you just want to follow up? There was a question of um, someone had missed the early part about signing up for individual time slots or if it's going to be a village and what we're thinking about. Yeah, so we're going to uh, be sending out at some point in June a um, a, a link to, to sign up for a time to drop and to drop off your camper and to pick them up. Uh, it won't be exactly the down to the minute what you're maybe hoping for or looking for, but it will be like 1130 to noon. Uh, and you'll just be able to like click that and, and that'll be your, your time to, that, that'll be when we're expecting you to come down the road. So yeah, families will have a, uh, some say in the timing, whether that's mid morning or mid afternoon, it'll, it'll be mid morning to, to mid afternoon, I'm guessing. And we will be arranging for the families, um, for, for campers who are at camp during intercession to be able to have a FaceTime video with their parents one time during intercession. Um, we will not be giving them back their SIM cards during intercession. Um, as you can imagine, we need to be really careful with what campers are doing when they're under our care. And so keeping the SIM cards away is really important even during intercession. Uh, so uh, Jamie, we will get information to you guys about, about luggage and bins. This was literally hot off the press, like over the weekend, this recommendation came in. Neil, Amy, and I haven't even had time to talk about it. Um, but as we as we work on these final recommendations and recognizing you need to purchase and buy things, we will get this to you um, with plenty of time to uh, buy and prepare. Uh, so Cayuga and Mohawk villages are back to where everyone is back to their original locations. Um, so there was 
a long period of time where we weren't sure if the senior camper program would be able to live out in the village of Tuscarora. Uh, and they are able to live in their tents um, with reduced capacity. So that means that the younger boys and the older boys are in their original villages, which we are very excited about. That catches us up to all of our questions and brings us right up. Yes, so um, Tusk is a four or a seven week session, that is correct. Um, so we, again, as we were adapting to all of these changes for the summer, uh, we realized, well, we planned kind of around, around our senior camper program. But then we realized we were making all these adaptations and we didn't think to make adaptations for our senior camper program. Um, something that I've been talking a lot about is that you know, Seneca Lake was founded in 1928. <clears throat> um, and up until 2019, we kind of followed in what was the footsteps before us. And we did a lot of things because that was the tradition and the history. We're still going to do that, but this pause in 2020 is allowing 2021 for us to have a fresh new set of eyes on things. And so taking the best of the things that we know um, and also giving us the opportunity to try new things. So our senior camper program is either four or seven weeks. Um, <clears throat> the details that we haven't finalized is when we're going to ask that those campers in their four weeks to make the decision of when they're staying or if they're staying or not, or let me rephrase more importantly, if the families are gonna allow the kids to make a decision on whether they're staying or not, and we will work with you guys beforehand. Um, <clears throat> nothing has changed um, about color war and fight song, and we know it's a big part of camp. Uh, and, and here's what I'll say from the bottom of my heart of full love. I never had fight song. I never had a color war. And I could sit with you and we could argue or have a great conversation about how both of our, our summers were the best summers that we ever had. So is there gonna be color war and is there gonna be fight song? I don't know. Here's what I know. We're gonna have amazing experiences this summer at camp. We are gonna be a part of a pioneer group of people who are going to be the first people back at camp in two years and are gonna set the stage for what the next 90 plus years look like. And that's really, really special. So there's gonna be new additions to the big part of camp. And what I want you to know is that you're a part of that and that's gonna be really awesome. Um, so how many people per tent in Tusk? Neil, you wanna talk about this? Yeah, and I'm just gonna jump off of what you said a moment ago about the programming, Lori, and say that the, the goals of programming at Camp Seneca Lake have not changed. Uh, and you can, you know, name a, name a program and we can talk about the goals for hours and hours and hours and, and why we do things. And those things have stayed uh, intact. What it actually looks like may change. You know, mass program sometimes has five teams, sometimes it has three teams, sometimes it has two teams. But uh, the reason why we do it hasn't changed. And, and our ability to provide programming in 2021 that meets those goals or, or allows campers to find avenues to success in those programs uh, will also be in place. So will Color War be red versus blue, two teams at the end of August? No idea, but that's not the important part of those programs. And we can talk more about this during the summer. Uh, Lisa, I'm happy to talk to you uh, at length about this, but rest assured that uh, Tusk will have leadership opportunities in those programs and that programs of some kind uh, that mirror or parallel what we think we know of programming at Camp Seneca Lake will exist and will happen. Um, but I, I don't know if you're just trying to like get the date out of me for like when Color War is, because that seems to be a popular thing. It's like August 13th or something, but uh, no, that, we're not there yet. <laughs> uh, and so to answer your question about the, to answer the question about how many people are living in uh, tents in Tusk, right now we are planning for three, the fourth occupant being a brand new box fan. Neil, yeah, that was just great. Loved that. Um, and box fans are actually, fans were just came out as CDC as a recommendation for um, helping with ventilation and circulation and keeping COVID out. So we're all about the fans for the summer. Um, our Mohawk cabins have not been updated. They are the last village uh, that is waiting for a beautiful makeover. And um, I'm really proud at the work that we've done at for camp this already this spring to get ready for the summer. And rest assured, we know that the Mohawk cabins need updating. Uh, and we're working on the beginning phases of what a capital campaign will look like at camp. And those Mohawk cabins are top on our list. 
<clears throat> uh, Jen, to answer your question about the COVID um, handbook, we absolutely, we will be updating those policies. Um, we really have been waiting for New York State. So the hope is not to have to update it twice. Um, so that initial book that we put together was the stake in the ground. The final book will come out after we have guidance from New York State, just so that we're not going through another couple of sessions with you guys with our thoughts and then the final recommendations. Uh, but it's great to hear that your public school just ended daily temp checks. Um, those are the types of things that are really helpful for us to hear and to learn about. And uh, we're just very patiently waiting for the recommendations to come out um, and the guidelines from New York State. So if you know anyone in New York State that can get us those guidelines, let us know. Maria, I will, I will say that we are optimistic about the New York State guidelines for operating overnight summer camps. Very uh, much, yeah. Today, I think it was today, it might've been yesterday, uh, Cuomo, Governor Cuomo was in Syracuse and announced that like the great New York State uh, fair is gonna happen from August 20th to September 8th and that uh, outdoor uh, sporting events and concert venues will be able to operate at 50% capacity starting in like late May. So we are optimistic that things in New York State are trending in the right way to make sure to allow for camps to operate uh, perhaps under less strict uh, guidelines than we had anticipated maybe even a month ago. So we are optimistic uh, that those things will come soon and that they'll be um, in the on the side that we want them to be on. Neil, do you want to take the next question also that just came in about luggage? What is the reason for not allowing us to drop off luggage and bags at the JCC and staff bring them to camp? Yeah, there's a couple of reasons. Um, first is just logistically, we don't have as many staff and we hadn't planned on having as many staff as we have in the past. Uh, and the expendable people to drive uh, to Rochester and load a luggage truck and drive back to camp uh, ahead of time during our training it's really tough for us to, to not have those people around. So that's that's one part of it. Another part of it is um, just like the flow at the, at the JCC with traffic and members and making sure that it's a safe space having tons and tons of people and luggage and in and out of the, the parking lot um, was not a recommendation that uh, the JCC wanted to make for us. And thirdly, if the unfortunate circumstance of someone coming to camp or getting that PCR test ahead of of ahead of camp and testing positive for COVID and then half of their stuff or two weeks worth of their stuff is already at CSL creates another logistical uh, problem for us. So we thought it just would make sense, bring your camper, bring your luggage together uh, to camp. And it, if things go poorly, then uh, at least all of those things are together and, and we don't have to worry about shuttling things back and forth. Also, um, not even half of our families are from Rochester. so. Doing that for Rochester would mean we'd have to expand to uh, what we had done in the past, Buffalo, Syracuse, Maryland, et cetera. And we just don't have the staff available to do all of those things. Um, but we are, we are. I think I sent an email about this a couple of weeks ago. We will be uh, collecting bicycles at the JCC in the days leading up to the uh, to the Tusk uh, or Senior Camper Program beginning. So bicycles, we we will be able to accommodate just because. Bicycles don't fit in the car the same way that a duffel bag does, uh, so that will be that will be one piece of it. Now, if you want to uh, communicate with us offline about uh, how to get your luggage to camp, uh, either by FedEx or UPS or dropping it off at a different time or something like that, that's something that we can have a conversation offline about. Neil, this is your favorite question: Can Tusk campers, campers bring food? Food. That's your a tough favorite one. Question. You, We've been thinking about it for a really long time. Uh, and like, I just don't, I still don't understand what the draw to ramen noodles is. Like I have some in my cabinet there, but that's for like when there's literally nothing else on planet earth to eat. Um, I think, like, I, and I love ramen noodles for sure, but uh, there, will be, there will be food, there will be snacks, there will be additional uh, nutrition to subsidize uh, what we provide, what is provided in the dining hall in the villages. So no, Tuscarora campers or any campers for that matter may not bring food to Camp Seneca Lake. And I'll say that, I've said this like five times already, but if you're like really desperate for ramen noodles, just like pump the brakes, give yourself a couple of, uh, maybe like two years, a year and a half or something, and you'll be away at college maybe. And uh, you can eat all the ramen noodles you want there. They're only like 25 cents a package. Uh, but the, the food in the dining hall is better than ramen noodles, I promise you that. <laughs> Neil, <laughs> you I will say also, that we've increased our snacks yeah. and we're 
maybe going to make sure that we've got lots of canteen. Yeah, yeah. And there's, uh, thank you, uh, Amelita, for, for that thing about the raccoons. And yes, uh, I'll tell you a funny story. In 2012, I'll try to keep this short. In 2012, I lived in Tuscarora in the tent platform known as Sclera World, which is the last one before Susie's place, like all the way at the end of the village. And the, I wasn't a Tusk uh, counselor. I was the photographer. I was working in programming. And the guy I was living with, his name was Mike Padalano. And uh, around 5 a.m., uh, early on in the summer, he woke me up and he said, Neil, I'm going on the bike trip with all the Tusk campers. There are uh, two peaches and an apple. I'm leaving them here on the floor at the end of, your, at the, end of the bed. Uh, I'll be back in three days. But it was five in the morning and I, I clearly wasn't awake or able to like hear him say that. So he left all this fruit under the, under the bed and it went rotten. And uh, I don't know, two days later after intersection or something, I came back and there were just like raccoon footprints all over my tent. Uh, and they harassed us every single day for the rest of the summer. And it was, it seems like cute and kind of funny, but like they would actually crawl my face while I was sleeping uh, I say sleeping while I was like laying there, I couldn't sleep because of all these raccoons. So uh, having food outside of the dining hall or outside of the area sort of contained in the middle of camp is really dangerous for a number of reasons. One is like the, the animals that are coming, the raccoons, the squirrels, the chipmunks, all of that stuff. But also uh, not every person that comes to camp is able to bring food with them. And we don't want to exclude anybody that is uh, perhaps not in a position where they can like bring ramen noodles to camp for whatever reason. Uh, by saying that some people can, and if you if you can't, sorry, you, you just, you know, the way it is. So uh, no, nobody will be able to have food outside of uh, what is provided by Camp Seneca Lake. Uh, but Tusk gets plenty of stuff. You guys get like pizza parties and canteen all the time anyway. You, you'll be fine, don't worry. Thank you, Neil. Yeah. So um, we've caught up on our questions and it is nine o'clock and so, I would like to uh, close out our evening by thanking you yet again for spending time with us. Truly, this is one of the highlights every month um, is coming together. And again, I'm, I'm so we're so grateful for you uh, entrusting in us on this incredible journey for the summer. Uh, stay tuned for an email with a summary of the information that we talked about tonight. Uh, and we hope to see you soon. So have a wonderful night. Viola Tov. Good night, everyone. Thanks, Lori. Thanks, Neil. Thank you.